evening and welcome to uh, an author talk with Rochelle Riley. And she's going to be uh, spending some time with us today uh, discussing her latest book, That They Lived, African Americans Who Changed the World. And so she has co-authored this piece with Christy Smith-Jones. And so this is the second time we've had the pleasure of having Rochelle Riley in the Center for Black Literature and Culture. And we're just so honored uh, that she wanted to spend some time with us. So uh, she uh, lives in the Midwest, lives in Detroit. And uh, I'm just going to let her tell a little bit more about her and the book. And then we're going to have some uh, deep dive and conversations. So go ahead, Rochelle. Thank you so much, Nichelle. I am so glad to be here. The center is one of my favorite places in the world. You know how much I love the beauty of it and the fact that it exists. And I'm jealous and still want to create that here in Detroit. Um, I used to be the media. I was a longtime columnist at the Detroit Free Press, nationally syndicated, loved my job. It was what I wanted to do my whole life. I remain a you know writer by trade, warrior by necessity, even though I have a new job. I left the newsroom and I'm now the director of arts and culture for the city of Detroit. It's the only job I would take in city government. And it's amazing because it means I get to be an advocate for our creative workforce. Congratulations. Oh, thank that's, you. That's amazing. That's thank amazing. Thank you so much. But I also still write because it's in my soul. It's in my spirit. I miss my column every day when something crazy happens, but I also love writing my books and I'm so excited about this one. So I wanna share a couple of slides that'll explain how we got started. Awesome, that would be great. Thank you so much. So um, in the... the- Okay, I've gotta stop you. Oh. This is so cute. <laughs> I mean, this is, I mean, this just too cute and you don't even have to have any writing in here. But if you just had these pictures, that would just blow me away. But, but go ahead. She's an important figure. Well, but this picture is just but you, you, you are having the reaction I had when I saw this. This was my introduction back in February of 2017 when I was working on my book, The Burden, African Americans mm -hmm. and the Enduring Impact of Slavery. An, an amazing book. An amazing book. Let's say that again. The Burden. The burden. Uh, Rochelle Riley. So run, don't walk and go pick that up. It's talking about a lot of things that we're going through right now. That was so much just like right ahead of what was really happening. Uh, an amazing piece, but go ahead. Thank you so much for that. So I was on deadline and I'm busy, but you know, I'm, a, I'm addicted to social media. My Twitter feed it sometimes has smoke rising from it at Rochelle <laughs> Riley. But I went on Twitter and Facebook and I was presented with this and I stopped what I was doing and said, oh my God, this is awesome. And every day that February of 2017, one of these pictures would pop up. This is Daisy Bates, who was a journalist and mentor to the Little Rock Nine, those nine kids who on their own integrated uh, Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I thought, this child is not just wearing a wig and some pearls. She has embodied Daisy Bates. Really so then, you know, every day I would look for these from Christy Smith-Jones, this you know stay-at-home mom outside of Seattle. And then of course, bam, there was another one. Oh. Giovanni, one of my favorite poets. And I'm like, she not only, like again, it's not just makeup and the hair and, this is little Lola at five years old who became these women, these iconic African-American women. And I was just mesmerized. So that's the same young person. This is this is Lola. Oh, this I is thought Lola. those are two different people from the first these are and second. All Lola. These are all yeah. Lola. She's a chameleon. And oh wow. She she literally became these women. So she became Maya Angelo. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage need not be lived again, we need to be thinking about that now. And I said, okay, I have got to find out who this woman is, but I didn't have to, I was working on the burden. I had to finish my book. So the burden came out in February of 2018. I was done, we're now you know, pushing the book and the pictures came up again. And I said, I've got to call this woman. I have to find her. I went on Facebook, I sent her a message. She sent me her phone number, I called. She knew who I was. She was excited by my calling, which just humbled me. And I said, Christy, these photos are amazing. Tell me how you started doing this. And I was thinking maybe I'd write a column. And she said, this is how I'm teaching my daughter about these amazing women that she should know. And I went, well, you know, they say pictures are worth a thousand words. I got a thousand words for each of these pictures. I would love to tell more of their stories so people can learn about them because I've been on this decade and a half mission for us to teach one America, one history. Because as long as we teach this segregated history, 
in America's public schools, we will always be raising racists who think that African-American kids are only descended from enslavement and white kids are all descended from gentry and richness. And so I said, just, just let me write some essays, biographical, inspirational essays to go with the picture. She said, mm -mm, oh no, I, I, I could never do that. I'm the stay at home mom, amateur photographer who took the first pictures with her iPhone and she was just not having it. So I got on a plane and I flew out to Seattle and got in a car and drove to Kent and took her family to lunch and begged her. And she finally said, okay, you can use the pictures. So we are collaborators more than co-writers because okay. she, she gave me the pictures and that was it. She said, okay, have at it. And so wow. um, I got all excited when she said yes. And I said, Christy, you know, there's so many amazing African-American icons. We could do a whole encyclopedia, African-American business people, African-American musicians and singers and entertainers, African-American sports stars, African-American scientists. Let's do a whole encyclopedia. She said, I'm not doing any of that. I said, oh Lord. I said, so she said, we're doing one book. I'm only gonna do one book. And I said, well, if we're only gonna do one book, we cannot leave out boys and men. And she said, well, you're right, but we have to find a boy. Mm -mm, we don't have to find a boy. I've got a grandson. So I flew to Dallas. I got my grandson, Caleb, and that's how we got that they lived. African-American. Oh, wow. My grandson, Caleb, when he was eight, portraying W.E.B. Du Bois and Thurgood Marshall, two men who literally their imprint on American life and, and continuing impact on our lives is unmatched. So for all yeah, Americans, for all Americans. Americans, there are hundreds and hundreds of African-American icons that we could celebrate. But I tried to pick those who literally because of what they did changed the world. Thurgood Marshall won more cases before the US Supreme Court than any other attorney anytime, anywhere of any color. So, you know, th that was our, that was how, cause people ask, well, you know, how did you just pick 21? Um, but anyway, so she said one book and that's what we did. And I was so excited as we sort of chose those. But after that, that was it. I then went off for a year and did research on each of the people we chose. And I was looking for those moments when they were children that changed their lives because I wanted to teach children that there's something that could happen now while you're nine to 15 years old that will, you know, set your path or help you with your journey or help you make a decision. And literally, so Bessie Coleman, you know, the amazing African-American aviator whose brother told her that black women did not fly, African-American would not fly, African-Americans in America would not fly airplanes. So she flew to France and learned how and became the most famous African-American aviator of all time. Or Jackie Robinson, when he was 16, he was in a game. And his brother got him out and he played four sports and then he broke the color barrier and was the first African American to play in the major leagues in the modern era. Rosa Parks, who decided not to give up her seat and what people don't always talk about is she was a civil rights worker and she was one of many women who did that and they were just demanding that the system change. They were fighting the system all the time. She got arrested and she became famous but it was Claudette Colvin who at 15, nine months before Rosa Parks gave up her seat, um, did, refused to get up, who refused to get up and was arrested. And as her name is on the lawsuit that ended segregated transportation. She was 15 years old and look at Lola. I mean, like I said, it's not just that Christy found the exact costume, the exact glasses, the exact you know hairstyle, but Lola became these women she was learning about. Mm. So we needed to do the same thing with Caleb. His favorite was Frederick Douglass and the hair. He wanted to go to the movie theater on one of our breaks in, in, film, in uh, photos uh, with the hair. I said, I don't think you can go as Frederick Douglass. You can go as Thurgood Marshall. But <laughs> teaching him about this young boy who literally grew up in enslavement and knew that the most important thing in life was to learn to read, that quiet determination in his face. I just, you know, and Shirley Chisholm, it is not just that Lola is wearing the wig and the glasses and the earrings, but look at how she squared her shoulders back because mm. she was portraying Shirley Chisholm. And Duke Ellington, when we told Caleb about how he at 15 years old wrote his first composition, even though he didn't know how to read or write music and how it made him so happy. Caleb sat right down at the piano and did this and Christy and I were doing this and I went, oh wait, no, we need to take the picture. So it was just an amazing photo shoot. And what was stunning is that Christy, who as far as I'm concerned is as you know, good as the professionals that I know, um, was able to do in four days with Caleb, what she did over you know, two years with Lola. And this is my favorite because you know, as far as I'm concerned for black women, as we know, um, 
suffrage for us was not in 1920, it was in 1965, thanks to folks like Fannie Lou Hamer, who was beaten nearly to death for registering Black people to vote. She literally changed the system, changed America, changed the world and how we see each other. And I, I just look at Lola portraying her, her, the set of her mouth and the way she looked. I mean, all of the photos are stunning and there are dozens of them. And I still want to do an encyclopedia. I haven't convinced Christy yet. I haven't, haven't even convinced her to do publicity for the book. She does not do these. And Muhammad Ali, who I knew personally and, and adored, um, Caleb portraying him and knowing that his fight outside the ring was as big as the one in the ring was amazing. And this one is not in the book, but we're going to be asking kids across the country in a project that I'm doing with Alice Randall, author of Black Bottom Saints, where for Juneteenth and for Halloween, we're going to be asking kids, don't dress up as ghosts and goblins, dress up as your favorite icon. This is my friend, Carla Walker Miller's granddaughter. She is the CEO of Walker Miller Energy Services, a major energy company. And she chose for her granddaughter, Alice Parker. Alice Parker, an African-American woman in New Jersey, got a patent in 1919, the year before American suffrage, um, for central heating because New Jersey was cold, the fireplace wasn't enough and coal was dirty. So she literally got a patent for a central heating system and it's how we stay warm to this day. So that is how we got started. And that is um, the amazing story of how I met Christy Smith Jones, who continues to work with Lola, who is now older and wiser and still learning black history. Wow, that is amazing. I can barely uh, take it all in and process it. Um, I mean, it was it's just amazing and so powerful. And, and I would say that I knew everyone except Alice Parker. And so, you know, there's always more to learn, which is amazing. Uh, but can you tell me again and expound a little bit more on why this is so important? Let me just read you a little bit. At the beginning of the book, we have our story and why we did this, it's, it's sort of a note from the authors. Christy wrote, one afternoon in January, my daughter Lola, who was five at the time, came home from school and told my husband and me about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. She had watched a video about him and I was surprised at how well she seemed to grasp concepts such as segregation and the dream that Dr. King had. It got me thinking and with Black History Month right around the corner, I decided that it was an opportune time to begin teaching her about some of the women who paved the way for so many. This is what every child of every color who lives in America should know. We literally teach a segregated history. So we have left out a half of history that is so important and affects how we see each other, how we treat each other, what we pass for laws, which is why we went from enslavement to Jim Crow laws to you know, the sort of subtle discrimination that continued even legally in this country. When I bought my house, uh, when I moved to Michigan, the deed had in it that it could not be sold to uh, black people. And the realtor was so embarrassed, she and the bank said, oh my God, we'll go and retype that and, and bring that back to the closing. I said, no, you won't. I want that to say just that so I can frame it. And people will know that I bought a house that once could not have been sold to me. It's how we've chosen to live. And when we use words like white supremacists and people get mad, you, you had a whole constitution and declaration of independence that literally lied and said all men were created equal even though men and women were being treated like beasts. We have always had a way of life that says white is superior, black is inferior. And that is what we teach our children, which is why it perpetuates from generation to generation. So when W.E.B. Du Bois said that the problem of the 20th century would be the color line, he did not know that the color line would be the problem of the 21st century. And if we don't start teaching a whole history and teach equality and equity and the real story of African-Americans, we will never change. So this is my effort to do that. The second thing, which was as important as it's, I know that that first goal is really hard. So while we're working on that, I want every child to know that every important person, every person who's famous, every person who changed the world, every important person was once a child. So all of these essays start literally with what they were doing when they were little. So for instance, Fannie Lou Hamer begins, Fannie Lou Hamer would grow up to be a powerful activist in the civil rights movement who fought for the right of black people to vote. 
But when she was 12 years old, she was Fannie Lou Townsend, the youngest of Jim and Luella's 20 children in a family of sharecroppers. And there was this horrible incident where they finally saved enough money to have their own house. And the white folks who lived near the farm where their house was did not want them to have it and burned it down. And they had to go back to sharecropping. And she turned to her mom and she said, when I get my chance, mama, I'm gonna do something to right this wrong. And she spent her whole life doing that. But that started when she was 12. Jackie Robinson, who would grow up to break the color line in Major League Baseball, when he was 16, he was in a game. Imagine how many kids are thinking that their way out of whatever their situation is, is to find comfort and camaraderie and even love in a gang. And instead they might be Jackie Robinson. That's the goal is to just give our kids this knowledge that you are fantastic and whatever you're doing now might make you even more fantastic. Wow, that is amazing. Um, this book, um, it, it's just so needed. Uh, and I'm a history buff, history nerd. Uh, so I love to do a deeper dive. And um, I was aware of Fannie Newell Hamer and all the things that she did and uh, speaking in front of uh, the Democratic Convention and, you know, not them not wanting to seat her. And I think that the things that you're bringing up, especially what you said about uh, buying your home in Michigan and the terminology that, that was in that contract. It wasn't so long ago. That's right. It wasn't another time. It wasn't our great grandparents' time. It was it was the time that we live in now was contemporary. And that has had an effect. And so gentrification, redlining, we're still being affected by those things today. Uh now we've been able to rise above a lot of that and you know still uh achieve, but it's been a long, hard struggle and not everyone has been able to join in that triumph. There have been some uh, people that have been left on the side of the road. That's right. And so I see your book as going back and picking those people up and dusting them off and talking about their story and sharing, uh, sharing just the, the struggle. Uh, and then even in the midst of struggle, we have turned it into triumph and art and jazz and gumbo and playing spades and, you know, the culture, you know, the and, oh yeah, yes, all of that in spite of everything that's going on. And so, wow, this is, this is really, really, really amazing. Uh, it this should be a book that everyone should have in their uh, personal library. I want this in the hands of every child, not every black child, not every Asian child, not every white, every child in America, because that way we start to really see each other at a time that for the first time in the world, people are really seeing black people. I hate that it took the death of George Floyd for people to stop what they were doing and actually think about how we live and what we've allowed, what we've tolerated. But I can tell you two of my least favorite words in the English language, well, three of them are diversity, inclusion, and tolerance. Because everything about what we do, and remember I wrote in The Burden that we've spent 150 years, African-Americans, seeking permission to be great, to be American, to be treated like full-class citizens, to, you know, you will, you will like us. I, I'm tired of us asking for people who once oppressed us to like us and let us succeed and let us into the CEO corner. We need to start teaching that we have always had the ability to do that. If we had you just sort of stayed with the lessons of reconstruction when Hiram Revels was a US Senator and we paid attention to what was possible, we would not have the country we have now, but we let racist rule. We cannot continue to let them rule. That's a very important point that you bring up because I think that oftentimes um, the prevailing thought has been with others is that reconstruction failed. It did not fail. It, there was a backlash against it. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for us to study history uh, because if we don't study history, we're doomed to repeat it. And I think that we saw that same backlash after the presidency mm -hmm. of Barack Obama and his eight stellar years in office mm -hmm. without a spot nor blemish. And from there, we received the next president that we received. And so there's a huge, there, there's something to that. And I think uh, we ignore history at our peril. And so yes, it's important for us it. to understand that. And so I think your book highlights 
uh, individuals and their struggle and uh, their triumph and um, just the depth and the breadth uh, of the people that you covered. And you covered Katherine Johnson, um, who recently yeah. passed away, the mathematician. You know, this is, uh, the person was a human computer. And, you know, she was doing things by hand and in her head. And, you know, if she didn't do it and right. Trusted, and trusted more than computers. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And so we want these not to be hidden. We want people to know them. We want, and as you said, everyone, not just Black kids, not just Asian kids, not just white kids, but everyone, because this is the American story. And if we're going to live up uh, to our creed, then we've got to to look at this story and, and give people the opportunity. And your words were so important. Literally, every time America has come close to being what it was supposed to be, what it could be, we would let that sort of cabal of uh, that minority of hate bring it back from reconstruction, from what could have happened with President Obama's tenure, with all that he did, literally, the, the, the folks who did not want that to lead to a better America had to try and tear down everything that had his name on it, to try and turn away, to try and pretend like that presidency was not as good as it was. And it's not about politics, it's about every time we try to do anything, you know, segregating schools. I was never someone who believed that the 54 decision in Brown versus Board of Education was the right way to go because it still was fighting for us to sit next to white kids instead of having equitable education. The so white lens, the white lens. That's it. So of course, what we got instead was, okay, we got to be in the school, but all of a sudden they're AP classes. So the white kids are in there while you're in the you know different program. Or you have literally schools that were declared uh, desegregated as they did in Louisville, Kentucky, where if one black kid was in the school, as with Louisville Male High School, led to a congressional <laughs> investigation, um, then the school was declared segregated. But imagine that kid having to deal with something like that. We have, this is the, this is the other word that, that bothers me, hidden figures. Every time there was an opportunity to showcase the excellence that was, it was tamped down or hidden or made sure nobody knew about it. And so we're acting like it's a great thing that we're discovering them and finally teaching them. I hate the, the I hate the idea of hidden figures because every time I see it, it's like, I'm so glad Katherine Johnson got her flowers and was able to live long enough to see what, what you know people appreciate what she did, but there's so many others who left this earth without you know, knowing that people knew that they did it and the inventions and the contributions are too numerous to mention, but look them up and see all the things that African-Americans have done that were literally hidden. And then we wanna celebrate if we bring them out every February, Just, we celebrate these folks like posters instead of like the people and the, the genius icons that they were. So that's why I want us to be glad that they lived. And I think that they can encourage adults and educate adults in addition to children, because uh, if we're honest, uh, it can be a trial. It can be difficult uh, to to be in these spaces uh, where we're kind of gaslit and told, "Well, no, that we're not ready for that." You know, don't really, you know. Uh, but yeah. if we look at what these individuals—courageous, intelligent, strong individuals have done, we too can do that. And uh, what I like to say at the Center for Black Literature and Culture is that we're Black 365, not just in February. And so okay. it is amazing the number of calls that I start getting in January, in the middle of February, and they're, we got to do something. Oh, we want to partner with you. We want to come. You know, what about February? What about February? I said, you know, we've actually got another 11 months. We've got plenty of time to share and do things and, and have programming. But that should just be the appetizer. February should be the appetizer, just to whet your appetite for a deeper dive and learning and understanding uh, in our history. Okay. Uh, and we know that we've had an impact throughout the world. Uh, and so it's the African diaspora the effect that we've had on the world, not just the U.S., but uh, this book is amazing. Um, you, you talk about so many people here. So you highlighted Muhammad Ali, Shirley Tism, Bessie Coleman, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, Duke Ellington, uh, amazing. Aretha Franklin. And yeah. so uh, she was a native of or grew up in Detroit, uh, Michigan. And uh, would you like to talk a little bit more about her? I, I would love to. Um, this one is very special to me because I also knew, not as a friend, but knew uh, the queen because I wrote about her. 
And while she was still living, I wrote this appreciation of her because I wanted her to have her flowers while she could have them. And so I had to, when Smokey Robinson was performing at what is now the Aretha Franklin Amphitheater, but at the time was called Shane Park. I went backstage and I sat at her feet, literally kneeled at her feet. Uh, Smokey was in another room and it was just the two of us. And I said, I just want you to know what you've meant to my life. And I wrote this piece, you know, it's a column, so you know it, it was known. But I said I wrote this piece about you, and I wanted to make sure that I told you about it so you could read it. She said I read it; it brought me to tears. It's one of the best moments of my life that I knew she had read it. She got it. She knew that. Thanks. But her story, and again, you know, the queen. Look at Lola. <laughs> that is so precious. This is how this one starts. Aretha, and everyone starts the same. Aretha Louise Franklin would grow up to become the queen of soul, an international R&B singing sensation and a quiet civil rights leader who helped African-Americans gain equality. But when Aretha was 12 years old, she was pregnant. If there was ever an example of rising above your circumstances, Aretha was living proof of it. She was born on March 25th, 1942 in Memphis, Tennessee to Barbara, a singer and pianist, and the Reverend Clarence L. Franklin, a nationally famous Baptist minister known by his initials, his initial CL. She grew up in the civil rights movement. Her father, CL Franklin, was literally the voice, and, and people knew him like across the country. And she traveled with him singing. And when she decided that she was going to sing R and B, he understood that there was this connection between gospel and R and B and that she could bridge that gap. And she did, and she sang both, and she was just the best. But I will tell you what people did not know until I wrote a piece for um, USA Today. That they, that they, they thought it was so good, they ran it on the front page of the paper and on the front page of the feature section in the same day. Wow. <laughs> that she paid the payroll for civil rights leaders and helped bail civil rights leaders out of jail during the movement. She was very close to Jesse Jackson, who talked to me about that time. She was always there. Her father helped organize the march in Detroit where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his I Have a Dream speech first before he then the next month, uh, two months later did it in uh, Washington DC when Mahalia Jackson told him, tell him about the dream Martin and he repeated the speech from Detroit. There's all this amazing history that people should know but she literally became the best there ever was at her craft. We need to study uh, at, at her uh, memorial service. There was a whole memorial weekend and there was an event at the Aretha where there was a tribute concert to her where people sang her music. And the folks from her favorite television show, The Haves and the Have Nots came. And John Schneider said to me, there ought to be some type of school where people try to teach the way Aretha sang, all of the things that she did, just sort of, nobody can do it like she did, but sort of at least teach what she did so that they can try. And I thought that was one of the most profound things anybody had ever said. So each one of the stories begins that same way. This person became this, but when they were this age, from Muhammad Ali, you know, he was Muhammad Ali, but when he was 12 years old, somebody stole his bicycle and he said he was gonna become a fighter. 12 years old. Cassius Clay. Yeah. Cassius Clay. Yeah. And, you know, you're right about uh, Aretha Franklin. She's the queen of soul. But that time that she stood in and, and sang opera. And, yes. you know, oh, so, so what was it about her and her mind and the way that she could unpack things and then, you know, bring it forth and, and make it their own? And also her confidence in herself. And that's that's important, too. This is, this is another reason why we chose these folks. It's why someone like Barbara Jordan is in the book. These are people who did not just change themselves or their lives, but they literally changed how people saw Black people. Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman in Congress. The first. That meant there would never be a time where somebody could not do that. Aretha Franklin was the best at everything she touched everything. She wrote songs for people. She um, could perform anything. When Luciano Pavarotti was sick and they said, well, we need somebody who can sell, uh, sing uh, Dessa Nord. And she said, okay, who else could do, who could do that? There, there's just this amazing quality about folks who are not just at the top of their game, but at the top of several games, at the top of the world. And we wanted people to know that they are not hidden figures. These are the folks that you know, but that you really should know. And, and it shouldn't be something that you just talk about in February. As you said, we're Black 365. 
we're famous 365. And I remember when Jesse Washington said at the NAACP Image Awards that time several years ago, just because we're magic don't mean we ain't real. Right, right, definitely. That was a powerful, powerful speech. I'll never forget and, it. I took up in my living room. Yeah, when he said that, I immediately, you know, looked for the text and was like underlining and circling. I mean, that could be a whole college course. And yes. he was a teacher. You know, he was yes. a teacher. And that's another thing that we don't necessarily talk about a lot is that these people are multifaceted. They're multi-layered. They're not just that one thing. There right. are a lot of things, but maybe this one thing is what has stood out. And I, as I'm listening to you, I think that what we really need to do, in addition to talking about these heroes and sheroes and learning about them and, and learning those lessons is look at the people in your own community that are doing this work. You know, you've mentioned uh, several times about giving people their flowers while they yet live. That's and right. so that is definitely something I, I, I wanna do. I don't wanna wait until someone has passed and that's when I'm grieving and I'm trying to do all of these things when we can't share it and enjoy it together. You know, it's a bit of a performance and it's kind of about me. It's not really about them, uh, but do that when they're there, you know, Think about the people that are struggling on the front lines right now, people in multiple organizations, people that are just the lone person crying in the wilderness saying, this is wrong. We've got to stop it. Let's do this. Look to those people in your community because it's really, really important. Absolutely. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about your process for research and I know you probably had volumes and volumes on each person. So how do you figure out how to pare it down, keep this, take away that? I know you've been writing for many, many years. So of course your experience was great, but what can you do to help others that are, you know, trying to go on this path as well? Because you're someone to be celebrated. And so, you know, Rochelle Riley needs to have a picture and some background on her. Thank you so much. I can tell you that it helped that I've been a journalist, you know, for so long. Um, I treated it like a, a news story, like a research project. And because I knew that my, my goal was to learn more about their childhoods, I've got a whole library now of all the books that I, I didn't like just Google things or go to the library. And I love libraries. I literally ordered the books so that I could read these different things that different people had written to find those moments that meant the most and to pull together something that could be comprehensive, but short and not short as in, oh, people don't want to read it, but short as in they really are essays that I want from nine to 90 people to dive right in, get it and come out because I didn't want to do an encyclopedia. And I didn't want to do something that, you know, a nine-year-old could not embrace. The greatest compliment I got, I sent the book to Caleb's mom and I said, okay, I don't want, I didn't send it to him. I don't want you to say anything. I want you to just hand it to him and then you watch him. So we'll know if he really likes it. And she handed it to him and he said, wow. And he sat down and immediately began reading it. And he looked up and said, this is good. That's it. That's all I needed. You know, I appreciate all the rest of it. I'm so glad that people around the country like it. But that moment where I know I'd gotten through to my grandson and he learned about these people and he embodied them and he understood who they were. That's the point. You want kids who are 9, 10 and 11 years old to know more than what they teach currently in the curriculum and which this Texas cabal that, you know, sort of takes over textbooks and tries to change the history and it's becoming whitewashed and manipulated. And, you know, th th it's the same group that wanted to call those who were enslaved migrant workers or, you know, pretend like they didn't know how they got here. And all of American history for Black folks began with colonialism and ends with the civil rights movement without saying why there was a civil rights movement. We literally have got to stop this disjointed teaching of our kids. So when we stop miseducating our kids, we'll stop raising racists and we'll start having a better society. But that's how the research was. Book after book after book. It took a year. Like I said, Christy did her part. She gave me the photograph. She went back to raising her kids. I spent a year going through all of the research, writing, rewriting, and trying to get each of them to the essence of what they needed to be. And then these amazing editors in North Carolina who work for Wayne State University Press here in Detroit mm -hmm. took over with the editing process because you always need a good editor. And it was probably just, one, it was one of the hardest and one of the most amazing experiences I had. The burden was easier because it was a collection of essays from lots of people. And I say this every time I talk about the burden, I called up people and said, I'm writing about how enslavement still impacts us. And every one of them, except for three people said, I'll stop what I'm doing and I'll do it. And when they all turned in their essays, I didn't have to call anybody back and say, I need you to write something different. Somebody wrote about that. They were all different. 
this one was just me writing what I needed to write about each of those folks. So I've progressed now from a collection written by other people to a collection written by me. So my next book is going to be a novel where I write the whole thing. Awesome. So was it difficult to, to set it down and in a way put it to bed? Because you said you did this over a year. So you were living and breathing with these characters. And then of course you felt good about it. Otherwise you wouldn't have taken it to print. But how was it to say, okay, I'm going to put you all down and we're not going to have that deep personal connection that we had for that year. That is such a brilliant question because it's almost like I didn't want to say goodbye. And then I remembered I wasn't saying goodbye. I'm introducing them to other people or reminding folks, you know, who already know or celebrating with folks who know and celebrate with me. So I kept having to tell myself I am doing something for them. So I'm not saying goodbye, but I want you to know that since I started working on the burden in 2017, I have slept with my laptop. So I have my laptop, I have my paper, I have papers all over the bed. I mean, I lived with those essays for the burden and I lived with these characters for that whole time when it was finished. And when it was finished, there were literally once a day or maybe two times a day where I would go, God, I wish we had put so-and-so or me. And the, and the publisher said, you know, you only want to keep it to about 20. And I said, well, there have to be 21 because if we put Rosa Parks, we have to put Claudette Colvin. So that's why they're in the same chapter. But those 21 were representative of what I was talking about, but there were so many others who could have been in there. Barack Obama is in there for obvious reasons. And I said, God, I need to put Barack and Michelle. And I said, no, she shared his life as first lady. Her book, Becoming, uh, was out. And I said, you know what? She is becoming in her own right, everything she has been, this amazing Ivy League graduate who had this amazing career, who then had this amazing partnership with her husband, which is why he was a good president. Um, she would be in the next one. You know, so I, I still think we need to have that encyclopedia. We're even thinking, not Christy, because she's done, but we're even thinking about doing a website where we continue to tell these stories. So, oh, wow. That would be you know, powerful. In that way, we can get all the hundreds out there. But yeah. to start, know that these are not the only ones. And that's why it's not, there's no number. We didn't put 21 as if that was all. It's just African-Americans who changed the world. And there are many more. Okay, awesome. You touched upon um, Texas and their uh, textbooks and, and their power. And I think probably a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of that. This is very important. If you could just expound upon that a little bit and tell us why Texas has so much weight and what they're doing there. I'm glad to talk about it because this is how I started the One America, One History effort that I wanted to turn into a campaign and have not done it yet because I've had two or three jobs. But um, <laughs> For years, Texas uh, bought more textbooks than every other state, including California, which means the textbook publishers wanted to make sure to keep them happy because that was their biggest customer. So they would uh, yield and uh, relent and consent to the types of changes that these folks would lobby for. That lobby has done more detriment to American textbooks than any other group of people in America. And the most famous one was when they did not want the word slaves in the textbook and literally had them take that out. And they either called them migrant workers or, or, or laborers or whatever it was. I, I wish I had pulled that up before our chat. But if you, if you literally look up textbooks, slavery, migrant workers, volunteer, however it is, you will read that whole story where this mom got her son's history book and said, wait a minute, what are they talking about calling those who were enslaved workers? And he said, oh yeah, that's the new textbook. Well, they did not reprint the book, but they sent out these things, these disclaimers that they wanted teachers to put on the book saying, you know, that it was a mistake and th these folks were actually enslaved. And I'm like, do you see how quickly we can go down that slippery slope to mm -hmm. dishonesty and lies and myth instead of telling the truth? So we have to fight that, not just with politicians who don't want black people to vote and white supremacists who like the idea of white supremacy, which, you know, I was so sad to see um, the, the lone black Republican in Congress stand up and say, America is not a racist society. I don't know where he lives. I don't know how they got him to do that. It doesn't say anything horrible about us that we recognize who we are. We are a racist society only because we allow the racist to be in charge. That doesn't mean everyone in America is racist, but yes, we are a white supremacist country that was built on black labor that has never been paid for its services. I want us to stop using the word reparations because that is an evil word that will always uh, yield a debate. It's an invoice, pay the bill. Mm. You know, we built America, pay the bill. 
So I, I'm, I'm working on that essay now about the invoice that's that's owed. So we can you know look at it a different way. Um, but but that's that's the thing that gets me that we have allowed small groups of people, you know the 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 Lindsey Graham's of the world who literally said we're not going to elect any more Republicans if we let people vote by mail. Now they're trying to stop people from voting by mail because we have to elect his people in the cult. That's not how it's supposed to work. We have we have the. the we're clinging to this vestige of a democracy by a thread. So we have to fight the small groups of people who would make America worse. Yeah, so powerful. And uh, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, talked about the check uh, that had been presented and it came back stamped NSF, uh, insufficient funds. That's and right. so uh, we, we have to think about that and we have to think about our history. And so it's important to know that when you're looking at those textbooks, there's often, a certain lens that it's coming from. And that's why it's important to dig into some independent sources, kind of get a full picture and a full understanding. And again, what you said was so important, we've got to share it with everyone, not yeah. just with a certain segment of the population. So uh, I want to end our conversation uh, delving into Ida B. Wells a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, Ida B. Wells, uh, I'm going to read a, a couple of the portions of her story uh, that you've written so eloquently. Um, and she's just a major, major figure. Uh, oh, that is precious. That is so precious. That definitely uh, gives her essence. Uh, Lola did an amazing job. I can see Lola and, and, being an actress or a director. She's just- And a as, a journalist, as a journalist and writer, she's my hero too. So we share that, but please. Ida B. Wells would grow up to be an investigative journalist, civil rights leader, educator, and activist. Her efforts, efforts to end lynching. So she was working on that many, many years ago, and we still are dealing with lynching. The crime of hanging Black people from trees would make her one of the most famous Black women in America. But when Ida was 16, she lost her parents and a brother to a yellow fever epidemic, and she became head of a household of children. Ida was one of eight children born to James Wells, a Shaw College trustee and carpenter, and Elizabeth Lizzie Wells, a famous cook. Ida was visiting her grandmother Peggy Wells' farm and escaped the plague. Wow, just sit with that for a minute. Mm -hmm. So we might not have even had Ida be well. Had she been home? <laughs> Ida did not want her five brothers and sisters to split up and sent to live in different places. So she lied about her age and became a teacher and raised her siblings herself with her grandmother's help. In 1883, Ida's grandmother died from a stroke. So Ida took her two sisters to live with an aunt in Memphis. And Memphis was a long way from Holly Springs, Mississippi, where Ida had been born enslaved on July 16, 1862. She was free a year later when President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. I won't read any more of that, but if you just think about that, what she dealt with as a very young, young child to have lost her parents, but still had that fortitude that I want to keep my family together. And you lose your grandmother, but you say, I'm still going to continue to shoulder on and, and do the things that I need to do. And she just had such strength of character and that would hold her in great stead as she fought for lynching and was um, a newspaper a columnist. She owned a newspaper and there were lots of threats on her life. And so her descendants are still living. She went later and moved to Chicago and, you know, people can read all about that. I love Ida B. Wells. She's just an important, important figure and everyone should learn uh, more about her. So her book is definitely uh, one that we should all get. And so now I'm trying to figure out, okay, how many nieces and nephews can I send this to, you know, without breaking the bank? Okay. Okay. Let's just do it in segments. Uh, and then I would encourage people to talk about this with your family, you know, read, uh, you know, in the afternoon or in the evening, if everybody is still separated, jump on Zoom and read a chapter and say, hey, what do you think? Have you heard about this person before? Just really let it sink in and don't uh, give other people the opportunity to educate your family and your children. Take it upon yourself. You have the power in your hand to pick up these books and spread this knowledge. Also talk to teachers and school boards about it. You know, we affect change and they represent us. So what we want is uh, most important. So don't let the powers that be uh, 
do too much of an exertion of things that aren't true. Um, I want to tell you about one more really fantastic moment that I had. This was several years ago when the burden was out. I was invited to this college to speak to these students. And I walked in and all of them were holding a copy of the burden because the professor had decided to make it their text, their textbook for that semester. And I nearly cried. And that's what I want for that they lived. I want to be able to know that there are elementary and middle school and high school kids because again, it is not age specific. It is for you to understand whether you're age nine to age 90, how much fortitude and courage and work went into some of these folks who literally because of who they became from those children changed the world. Amazing, amazing. So again, uh, the book is That They Lived, African-Americans Who Changed the World and the Collaborators, Rochelle Riley and Christy Smith Jones. And we're going to look to get more uh, about amazing people. So uh, at Rochelle Riley, you can find her on Twitter. And uh, this is. And if anybody a- wants to know more about me or about what's happening with the book, they can go to RochelleRiley.com. Awesome. So she's got a website too. You have no uh, excuses on not doing a deeper dive into this amazing, amazing author. Well, Rochelle, I just want to thank you so much for the time that you spent with us. Um, it's just been incredible. I've learned a lot. I'm inspired. I'm ready to take on the day. And um, I, I am, so I've got another book too that I've got to buy for the nieces and nephews. So I better get to get and start getting my coins together so I can spread the word. So it should start with us. So Rochelle has given us a tool. And so now we can take it in our hand and we can run with it. But this was an incredible time. Thank you. Thank you to the center. And thank you to you for all that you do. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much, Rochelle.